guys, it's Ty with Ty the Dog Guy in the Daily, and I want to talk today about counter conditioning. That's counter, C-O-U-N-T-E-R, conditioning. So uh, I was working with a client today, and the main reason the client came to us is because their dog has a lot of fear-based issues. And so um, where we start every dog that has fear issues is with um, obedience and structure and leadership and, and stuff like that. And so... I always think that that goes to kind of the core, the root of the problem of a dog needing to have a more calmer mind, of the dog needing to understand leadership better, things like that. And so that's a big part of what we're doing is is really improving this dog's obedience. And, and we're just two sessions in and so far it's really helping. Um, but we were kind of mapping out some more strategies that we're gonna be doing long term. And it made me realize, hey, this is some good stuff that I should be sharing on my podcast and on my uh, video blog, my vlog. And so I wanna talk about counter conditioning. So counter conditioning, um, I'm sure there's a good definition out there, um, but essentially it's, it's uh, starting to associate something positive with an area where, where a dog has some fear, you know, some fear-based issues. In fact, I think, um, when, I don't remember the scientists, I just remember reading about this a long time ago. One of the early scientists who kind of discovered this was helping a young boy get over his fear of rabbits. And so they started with the rabbit at a certain level, certain distance, and they would allow the boy to eat his food and, and gradually the rabbit would get closer and, and he really enjoyed eating his food and so he started associating um, the rabbit with eating his food and he got over his fear of rabbits. And so, so anyways, is it, it's associating something positive um, with, with a fear that the dog has. And so counter conditioning, the way that we were talking about in this case and the example I'm going to use just to kind of give, give examples and you can of course apply it to your dog in the way that makes the most sense for your dog. But, uh, you know, this dog has certain fears of, um, of men, well, of, of a variety of things, but let's, let's go, you know, on men. And so um, the idea behind counter conditioning is what you want to do is you want to find kind of what we would call the dog's threshold, you know, where their threshold is, what is the most they can take of this stimuli before they get really scared. Um, and so maybe it's a gentleman, a guy putting his hand over the top of the dog to pet the dog and getting six inches away is where the dog's like, oh, this is too much for me. Well, let's say that was the case. If we were going to counter condition, what we would do is we would take some food. We would bring our hands to within eight inches of the dog. So essentially we would, we would mimic or we would bring out the thing that is fearful to the dog, but we bring it out in a dose that they can handle. You know, dose that they can handle by themselves without help, without, you know, without going into conflict or anything like that. And so let's say at eight inches, the dog is fine. At six inches, the dog has a hard time. Now, that's obviously a very specific, result, you know, example. You'll need to kind of uh, <coughs> figure out your dog's, your dog's thresholds. But eight inches, dog is fine. Six inches, dog struggles. At eight inches, I bring my hand and then there's food. Eight inches, food. Eight inches, food. Eight inches, food. Over and over and over. So the dog starts to see this motion of the gentleman bringing his hand down and kind of likes it. And then it's seven inches food, seven inches food, seven inches food. And then we go to six inches food. Um, and the idea behind counter conditioning is, like I say, we're, we're taking this thing that the dog really enjoys and really wants and, um, uh, you know, helping the dog associate something positive with it. There's a story I often tell with counter conditioning. Um, my, my first experience with, well, I wouldn't, it's, it's my first time I recognized counter conditioning. I'm sure I had other experiences with it before that, but I remember this was probably 11, 12 years ago, um, had this, this great German shepherd. He was actually, um, he was actually a great protection dog. He was a very powerful dog, but he lived with owners that were a little bit overbearing. And so, and, and kind of shouted at him and yelled at him and he got to the point where, um, you know, when they raise their voice, even if they're raising their voice at each other, you know, husband, wife, the dog would submissively pee, he would urinate. Um, now, this dog loved the tennis ball. And so um, what we did is we started counter conditioning. At the time, I didn't even know what the term meant, but it was just something that we started doing. And so we would, uh, we figured out what his threshold was. And so we would say something like, hey, you know, an elevated tone, elevated uh, voice, hey, and immediately throw the tennis ball. And we'd do that a bunch. And then we got to where it was louder. Hey! And then throw the tennis ball. And eventually we got to the point where you could like get on all fours, get in that dog's face and scream. Hey! You know, scream as loud as you could. 
and his tail would start to wag. He'd be like, oh, this is awesome because I know the tennis ball is coming as a result of this. And so counter conditioning can be very powerful in that way because, like I say, it can, it can change the conditioning that your dog has and how they think about certain stimuli, things that make them afraid. Um, now, herein lies the catch. Counter conditioning can often have a very short, very low ceiling of, of effectiveness. Um, because there's a lot of dogs that their threshold is, is, is huge. You know, maybe they're, um, maybe they see a dog a thousand feet away and they're already terrified. And so to bring it from a thousand down to two feet, you know, would take years and years and years using just counter conditioning. So it's not terribly feasible. Or perhaps the dog doesn't have a motivator that's really, really big. In the case of this German Shepherd, he loved that tennis ball. It was a huge motivator for him. Um, but there's lots of dogs to where the, their motivation for toys, their motivation for affection, their motivation for food is there, but it's not big. And you can, you can build it and you can develop it, but it's not big enough to really overcome certain problems. Now, some trainers might say, well, you just need to work longer and work at their threshold longer, but that's usually not feasible and often doesn't work. You know, if, um, if we can't, if you simply can't help the dog love something, you know, a motivator that much more. And so counter conditioning, while it's a very valuable thing, and I'm hoping you're thinking of ways that you can use it with your dog to help your dog with certain fears, it does have a, have a low ceiling um, at times, can have, not always, but can have a low ceiling at times of effectiveness. And so where counter conditioning leaves off, there's a term called flooding that can actually take on at that point. And flooding can be very powerful as well when done right. So in my next um, podcast, I'm going to be talking about flooding. So hopefully, hopefully you can listen to that one too.